This was about a month ago that uh, I was so frustrated watching a close friend blow his brains out and absolutely destroy his life. And I wrote this in my blog. This morning I was struck by the horribly deceptive and debilitating irony of self-absorption. As people become more and more self-interested, oriented, and centered, they become less. In the futile attempt to fully find themselves, be themselves, meet their own needs, to matter, they actually end up losing themselves. The more one thinks about oneself and acts in selfish ways, the less value and impact that person's life has in their world. Isn't this so tragically ironic? Isn't this a parable of our human condition? especially as it plays out in our narcissistic, consumeristic, self-helpistic Western culture, acting in ways to benefit self even as we diminish ourselves, And then, as we increasingly diminish, desperately engaging the spiral with even more myopic energy. It's insane. And then, adding irony to irony, becoming increasingly less human, less valuable, less worth the respect of others, as a result. It's happening everywhere, in people's marriages, friendships, communities, churches, and spiritual lives. Think about the people who've had the greatest impact in this world, in your life. They flourished because they helped others flourish. They helped you. It wasn't about them. They engaged in the most counterintuitive kind of lives, not seeking self, and then found themselves. Surely, Jesus had it right when he said, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. And if you let your life, let your life go, you will save it. Let your life go into me, was his inference, of course. So this last couple of weeks, I'm thinking about community and doing a Bible study with a friend, and these verses from 1 John hit me. My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God because God is love. So you can't know him if you don't love. This is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. This is the kind of love we're talking about. Not one that we once upon a time, not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sins and the damage they've done to our relationship with God. My dear friends, if God loved us like this, we certainly ought to love each other. No one has seen God ever, but if we love one another, God dwells deeply within us, and his love becomes complete in us. Perfect love. This is how we know we're living steadily and deeply in him and he in us. He's given us, his, he's given us life from his life, from his very own spirit, Also, we've seen for ourselves and continue to state openly that the Father sent his Son as Savior to the world. Everyone who confesses that Jesus is God's Son participates continuously in an intimate relationship with God. We know it so well. We've embraced it, heart and soul, this love that comes from God. So thinking about community this morning, it's pretty clear in what was just read that to be community is to love. At its core, that's all you need to know. God is love. If you know God, then you are a person who loves out of his love. A community that purports to be a community that gathers under the auspices and the beauty and the leadership of God needs to be a community defined by love that when the outside of the faith community world looks in on this, they see something of God 
in the way that we love each other. For the past year uh, or so, our leadership team and I and staff and everyone at New Hope, a lot of us, are thinking about, have been thinking deeply about community, trying to grow community, make it happen. Um, all good things like having events and fostering activities to get, create opportunities for people to get to know people and grow the sense of community. This place is so kind of disparate and everybody's out doing their own life, which we really want, you know, I mean, of course. But we also realized we got to be something together in order to be the church as well. We organized events and are doing that and fostering activities, but it just hit me this week that maybe the most important thing that we need to do, and I see it growing in me and in our community, is just love people. And I find myself growing in love for this community, for the woman who once a month at 8.30 drops, pulls up to the front of our house and lets my son Edward, you know, 15 year, 16 year old boy with Down syndrome, run down the, the walkway to get in her car to come here to cut bagels and do cream cheese and set up tables. And like, who loves a little kid like that, like that? And when she loves him like that, she loves us like that. And when she loves us like that, the love of God is perfected. Or I think about every Sunday coming in here and seeing, you know, 15, 10, 15 people setting up, you know, 8.30 on a Sunday morning, and half of them had a lot of fun Saturday night before, and it's hard to get up. And they'd rather have slept in sometimes, and people just selflessly making coffee and putting all these wires in place and setting up the band Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. They said at new church planting school that if after five years you have not got your own building where the setup thing doesn't have to happen as much anymore, your church will fail because there's no church that has, you know, very few churches continue after five years setting up from scratch like this. Or I think about the couple that I met at In From The Cold a month ago. We came at 6.30 to set down all the beds, people living on the street, but they were there at 4.30 with their teenage daughter and their infant child as well, smiling like crazy, making breakfast for all these people waking up who live on the street. And I, I, I still remember standing in the kitchen and seeing that one of the people who's on that side of the kitchen wall knew the first name of the lady from New Hope, said, hey. And I thought, of course she would have let them know her name. And I love that. And I love this church as a whole, this cool vision that God has implanted in us, this neat direction that he's, this path that he's put us on. And I go, I just love being part of this community. I couldn't work anywhere else. I don't want to work anywhere else. I got an email this week from a church in Grand Rapids saying, you want to come work for us? And, you know, you got to sort of honor that. So I looked at the web page, and I just... They're looking for a guy who can pastor a seniors congregation that plays pipe organ every Sunday, and they all sit on pews. It's like, yeah, I'm your guy <laughs> for that one. I love this church and feel now, 10, 12 years into it, more compelled to give more of myself to this than I ever have. This is a very good thing we have and a very, I think, unique idea and vision and calling that God's given us that's had a unique kind of influence with us, increasingly more with us, but also beyond the boundaries of this little community. We need to grow it. We need to grow. You, you, you and I need to grow hearts of love to strengthen and undergird and found and build up this intimate part of New Hope Church, this community, so that this great idea can keep no on going. No combination of words you could put on the back of a postcard. No song that I could sing, but I can try for your heart. Our dream, they have made it a real thing. I got a shoebox to photographs, sepia tone loving. 